Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is May 25th, 2021. This video today is called Fear of Death. You may hear a war plane in the distance. For the last two weeks, almost daily, we have been uh, hearing the American military jets flying here over South Central Missouri. I really don't recall hearing them during the Trump years. Um, we heard them before that. But we, we are in very strange times now. And that's why I feel led to uh, bring this teaching today called Fear of Death. Because Babylon the Great has played upon our fears and has succeeded in making a vast number of Americans and not only Americans, Babylon the Great rules the world. Um, they have succeeded in making a vast number of the citizens of the world fear for their lives because of this COVID-19 so-called pandemic. It's just another one of their man-made diseases and another one of their fear-mongering plans. I want to try to help you break out of that fear today. I'm going to referred a little bit to some notes I made. Babylon the Great has successfully pushed its COVID-19 mask, separation, closures, and vaccine agenda because it has played upon men's fear of death. The people alive today fear their physical death, not their spiritual death or their soul death. The scripture is mainly concerned with those two deaths. First, the spiritual death, and second, the soul's death. The physical death is the one that we are repeatedly told not to fear. The reality is that Babylon the Great, the satanic government that has ruled the world for millennia, has deliberately kept mankind in a state of fear. They've always done this. Um, it's interesting. Uh, my wife and I have recently been watching some uh, very old uh, Robin Hood television uh, shows made in the 1950s, around 1955. And in that, in these, in these uh, videos, you clearly see how even back at the time of uh, Prince John and then King John, the powers that be kept the people in perpetual fear. It's almost like watching uh, today put back um, 800 years ago. It's amazing. Think about this. Those of you who are as old as I am, um, and some a little younger, would remember things like this. At various times over the last 40 years, for example, the powers that be promulgated through the mass media, because the mass media is their mouthpiece, have made us afraid of things like butter, 
eggs, whole milk. Why? Because it raises your cholesterol. And then after people quit eating those things, suddenly they realized or they found out they didn't have what's called the good cholesterol. They've tried to make us afraid of eating meat. And then they, if you remember, Rush Limbaugh used to talk about this in the 90s. They were saying, oh, don't eat smoked meat. Don't cook your meat over, over wood because that can cause cancer. As if, as if what God created and the main way that people made their food up until the last hundred years or so, as if that would cause cancer. And then other things that they still teach today. But you can go into uh, uh, a tanning salon. That's fine. But don't stay out in the sun too much because the sun will give you cancer water. Don't drink the water. We've got to put fluoride in the water. Oh, the fluoride. That will make the water safe. And then we've also been taught to fear countless man-made diseases. Suddenly something's come to my mind named Zika. I didn't write that down, but the ones I wrote down are AIDS, swine flu, SARS, bird flu, Lyme's disease, West Nile virus carried by mosquitoes, Ebola, and now COVID-19. Now I believe that most of those, if not all of those, were actually lab-created diseases. Think about it. What kind of government funds, with our tax money, the creation of pathogens, of things that will kill us, kill the citizens? That's what our government does. And then they use what they have created to instill fear in us. It amazes me. I go out. Sometimes I've been the only person that was not wearing a mask. And it's like I can look into the eyes of these, especially older people, older than I am, and it's just like fear in their eyes. Oh, what's coming upon the earth? Well, the scripture does say that men's hearts will faint for fear at what is coming upon the earth. Understand this. We're never going back. Things will never return to the way that they have been. And they're telling us that, aren't they? But what they have planned for you is hell on earth. If you're listening to them, one of the things they're saying is, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. Oh, really? Really? I can't have my own home. I can't have my own garden, my own land. I can't have my own car, but I'll be happy. Is that because you're going to feed me with your pharmacia, with your mind-altering drugs? Or is that going to be because you've now plugged me in to your machine through your vaccinations? You've now plugged me in so that you program me so that I, I'm happy. Is that it? It is so far gone for people to wake up. It's unbelievable that people have not awakened to what is going on. Oh, and they have the new, oh, are you woke? The people who are woke, like Black Lives Matter, Antifa, all this leftist agenda, woke, right. The satanic agenda is woke. The people of God are awakened to the truth. I want to take you now to some of the scriptures that deal 
with this issue of the fear of death because we have to break out of it. You can't live in the fear of death. You cannot be productive in the fear of death. You cannot be a light if you fear death. You cannot be salt in the earth if you fear death. And you sure cannot be a warrior in the kingdom of God if you fear death. First thing we're going to look at is Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. This is saying if we read the proverbs, it will help us to understand the things that Jesus said. He is the wisest of all, and his words are very hard to understand unless you stay in the word of God and you begin to learn the word of God. And then finally, verse 7 of Proverbs 1 says this, The fear of Yahuwah, the fear of Yahweh, the fear of Jehovah, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge. The very beginning. Then I'm going to read a couple short quotes from Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Hades. And then Luke verses 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Indeed, fear him. Well, who's Jesus? Why should we listen to Jesus? Well, let's remind ourselves. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2, and let's just read a little bit about Jesus. Hebrews 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now it's interesting for the next uh, quite a few verses, the writer of Hebrews is going to quote Old Testament scripture. I'm not going to uh, tell you what the references are in this teaching. You can uh, find that for yourself. But I myself am very interested in all of the prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament. And just to try to make it a little easier for me today, I purchased a book um, that is called uh, 400 Prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament, where someone has gone through the diligence to find 
all of those scriptures in the Old Testament that talk, that prophesy Jesus. So we're going to go through about 10 right now, which is just barely scratching the surface because there are prophecies of Christ everywhere in the Old Testament. So again, Hebrews 1 verse 5 says, and this is a prophecy, this is in the Old Testament, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, and this is talking about God saying through the word because God spoke through prophets who wrote down his words. That's what gave us our Bible. So of the Son, God says through his word, and here's the quote, your throne, O God, speaking of Jesus, he's calling Jesus God, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom, or the scepter of righteousness. The scepter of justice is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, God I'm speaking to, your God, the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And then another one. He quotes, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Jesus laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and he is Lord. And the heavens are the work of your hands, Jesus. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your, ear, your ears have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's what God said to Jesus. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So this writer quotes all these scriptures to tell us who Jesus is. He is God. He is the Lord. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And then he starts chapter 2 by saying this, Therefore, because this is true, because Jesus is this, and God prophesied it hundreds and hundreds of years before he was born, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. See, he's talking to Christians. And almost every Christian commentary I've read on the book of Hebrews will say that all these warnings are dealing with non-believers. No, they're all dealing with believers. And it's amazing how confused the believers are with respect to the time that we live in. They're all expecting some great glory to come, and so their churches become just so wonderful in the eyes of the world. No, 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 no. You may be involved in some great works of God. Yes, you will be, You're, because you are the faithful among these people are going to be like Elisha, the second, not like Elijah. Elijah did not die. Elisha, though, did double the miracles that Elijah did. And these people who are left but who are faithful are going to do great miracles. But it's not going to be wonderfully glorious like they think because it's going to be a world that is crumbling around them. Because Babylon falls while the kingdom of God begins to rise. Right now, we see thick darkness. Thick, thick darkness. Therefore, we must pay 
much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. This is talking about when Moses received the law. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Notice, it was declared at first by the Lord. It's talking about the living ministry of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And it was attested to us. He is one of us. This was told to him by those who heard. Those who heard are the initial apostles. This man who's writing the book of Hebrews, he is one who heard from these initial apostles. So again, I'm going to read this. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, and he's going to now read another prophecy. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little for a little while lower than the angels. For a little while lower than the angels. For a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. No, we don't, do we? We do not see everything in subjection to Christ. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, we are called to be sons. He is bringing many sons to glory. It is fitting. For it was fitting that he should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. This is a strange thing. How did Jesus become perfect through suffering? Well, I think it applies to the sons, for sure, that are coming into glory. Because they are made perfect through suffering. And it's, that's why they suffer. Because if they were strong all the time, never ill, never sick, always filled with power, then they would have become great in their own eyes. And they would have failed. God keeps his sons humble. He keeps his sons He afflicts his sons so that they remain humble. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. So Jesus and us, we have one source. That is God. And that is why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers. So we are the brothers saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. This is from Isaiah 8, and this is the chapter that I refer to often where it talks about always speaking according to the law and the testimony. And another scripture says, I will put my trust in him. And another, behold, I and the children God has given me. That's the scripture from Uh, Isaiah 8, Behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, 
he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death, he, Jesus, might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. So through death, because he was willing to die, Jesus destroyed the power of death, the one who has the power of death, which is the devil, Satan, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. See, as long as we fear death, we are slaves. As long as we fear to die, we are slaves. So Jesus came to deliver us from this fear of death. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He helps the people of faith, is what this is saying. He helps the seed of Abraham, the seed of faith. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to make atonement for the sins of the people. He shed his blood for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So that was Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. Hebrews is an amazing book. It's written to the overcomers. It's written to the firstborn. The book is all about the salvation of the soul, not the salvation of the spirit. And we have to distinguish that. We have to make that distinguishment in our understanding. Then I want to conclude today's teaching with um, some scripture from John chapter 5, starting at verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now, this is a very important principle here, that we are called to, and Hebrews gets into this, it, it, it remains, therefore, for us to enter into rest. Entering into rest means that you cease doing your own works, that you stop doing the works of the flesh and that you only do what you see your father doing. Now, that's, it's a hard, hard thing. I mean, we still live in the flesh. You know, it's not like I'm always hearing a voice from God saying, Glenn, do this, Glenn, do that, and so on. Not at all. Um... I read something from the Word of God every day. Try to. I mean, if I don't, then I don't get upset about it. But, you know, I try to read uh, from the Word of God first thing every morning. And it, uh, it's very helpful to start the day by reading the Word of God. And I pray that the Lord will take me to a place in the Word that He would have me go. Sometimes the Bible just opens to a place and I read a scripture and I go, wow, that was, that was a word from the Lord. And that's really very cool, very fun when that happens. I mean, it, because it's, it's encouraging. You know that God is hearing your prayer and um, then he's answering your prayer. And so that is always exciting. We know what our Father is doing 
by knowing the Word of God. So if you will take time to read the Word and then contemplate on the Word, this is why the the ox, the cow, is considered a clean animal because it chews the cud. It has a split hoof. It rightly divides the word of God, and then it mulls over its food. It, it continues to eat its food so that it's thoroughly digested. You know, as I've said so often, all of scripture is a parable, and everything God wrote speaks spiritually, speaks prophetically, speaks of spiritual things for us, and like the clean animals. And so we are to be like the ox that rightly divides the word of God and that eats the word of God and continues to eat the word of God, that brings the word back up into our memory and contemplates. So often I will have um, an idea that I think may originate, well, I believe it does originate from the Holy Spirit, and uh, that's usually how I know when to uh, bring another word and uh, to do another video that suddenly I will have a thought. And last night, as I was going to bed, I had suddenly several things come to me concerning fear of death. And this idea, in fact, even in conversations with my wife, we had some talking about this idea of fear of death. And that's often how a word comes to me is through communion with my wife. Well, does that mean that we sit around and we pass uh, some grape juice or wine and a cracker and pretend that that's the body and blood of Christ? No, not at all. But we will drink a glass of wine together and contemplate the word of God and talk about the Word of God. And so while we're communing together, having communion together, the Word of God is shared between us, and God reveals new things to us. It happens all the time. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So, this is how we know what God is doing. When we rightly divide the Word of God and we accurately understand the Word of God, then we know what God would have us do. So, then we know what God is doing. John chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Wow. Do you hear that? 524 of John. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me <coughs> has eternal life. So whoever hears my word and believes God who sent me, so what Jesus is saying is, these words are God's words. So whoever hears God's words has eternal life. Remember the saying, to hear is to obey. 
if you really hear, if you really hear Jesus' words as being God's words, if you really know that what Jesus said was the word of God, would you not obey it? Of course you would. But what does this tell us? This tells us that many people who say they believe don't believe. Why? Because they don't obey. They walk in the ways of the world. They walk in all kinds of sin and duplicity and worldliness in idolatry, in every sin that you can find in the scripture reiterated by Paul and reiterated by John in the book of Revelation chapters 21 and 22. You can find it. Sin is sin. Sin still exists. Even though Jesus died for our sins, he did not die so that we could live lawlessly, carelessly, and in sin. Whoever hears Christ's words and believes that they are the word of God, he has eternal life. That's how you know who has eternal life. Jesus goes on. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus says that those who have done that will never die. Our bodies may sleep. Physically, we, our bodies may die. But that person will never die. He will have saved his soul. Because if he really believes, he will work out his salvation the salvation of his soul, in fear and trembling, not wanting to fail in his responsibilities toward God. And thus he will escape the second death, which is the lake of fire, the application of God's word, of God's law to a person's soul so that they come into alignment with God. So this person, Jesus says, who does this, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, who believes God, the Father, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He has passed from death to life. That's amazing, isn't it? That's the gospel in one sentence. There it is in one sentence. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we make it so difficult. We make it into a lot of do's and don'ts and haves and have-nots. And at the same time, we make it into a license to sin. How did the church ever do that? Now, Going on, verse 25 in John chapter 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. Now here, right when I'm talking to you. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Okay, that's what happened to the apostles. That hour was there. That hour continues. And those who hear the voice of the Son of God as spoken in the word of God and as still spoken by his prophets and apostles and evangelists and teachers, those people who hear the voice of the Son of God will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice 
and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. He's talking about two different times here. One is now. Today, if you hear his voice, do not rebel as they did in the wilderness, but walk according to his word. This, that was in the book of Hebrews. Very critical book to understand. So, the second time he says this, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. He's talking about the people who have died and he's talking about the resurrection of the dead at the white throne judgment, which is after the millennium, after the kingdom of God is established and rules and puts all, all other authority under his feet. That is going to take a long time. And it's going to be the overcomers, the Kodeshim, the first fruits, who begin that process through power to begin the kingdom of God in earnest in the earth. And then it's going to be those who uh, were left, were not part of the first fruits, but come into the first resurrection, which will be shortly after that, I believe, after they have been tried with fire. That's the great tribulation. The Kodeshim have been in tribulation. The Kodeshim lived lives of tribulation. The Kodeshim have already been through fire. The first fruits Kodeshim have already been through fire. There are some who are ready to be resurrected, who are ready to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Those who are alive and still left at the, that particular time, which I believe is soon. I believe it must be soon because no flesh would be left alive if the Lord does not return soon. Babylon the Great is working overtime to exterminate mankind. They have an agenda to kill about 95% of the earth. Just read the Georgia Guidestones. They want a total of 500 million people. And right now we have about 8 billion people. So their plan is to exterminate a large, large percentage of the earth. And so um, Jesus prophesied no flesh would survive unless he returned when he did. The book, The Singularity, by Ray Kurzweil, written in the year, published in the year 2005, says that he expects the singularity to occur by the year 2030. He defines the singularity as the merging of man and machine. I believe that the COVID vaccination is largely about plugging people into the matrix, plugging them into the machine. And so, here we are. Do you hear Christ's voice? If you hear Christ's voice and know that that is God's word, then you have passed from death to life. And then you should no longer fear death because you have passed from death to life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will bring this teaching to life to those whom you have called, to those whom you have chosen for this hour. Amen.